Good morning, AMP. So here we are in chapter 26, the urinary system. One of the things you're going to notice is that this is extremely closely tied um, to chapter 27 when we get into um, both fluid electrolyte balance and acid base balance. And so the nice thing is these next two chapters um, should be very closely aligned. You should see a lot of repeats in chapter 27. So that should help you. So if I, if we were in the classroom and I said, hey, what, what's the role of the urinary system? Typically the answer I get is this idea of the removal of wastes, right? Things like urea. And that's absolutely true. That is one of the functions um, of the kidney. But we are going to see um, that it plays just this huge role um, in maintaining the homeostasis of fluid and electrolyte balance as well, right? And I, I would argue, I mean, you can't say one's more important than the other, right? You have to get rid of those wastes, um, but this is a really big job that the kidney completes, right? So we're removing physiological wastes, things like urea, um, but this maintenance of fluid and electrolyte balance, and again, a lot of this we'll, we'll get into in chapter 27 again, but what we see the kidney doing is, is working to regulate blood volume and blood pressure, right? Blood volume influences blood pressure. As blood volume increases, blood pressure increases. And it's going to do this, the kidney helps regulate this by doing things like determining uh, the, the volume of the urine output, right? If you need more water, let's hold on to it. If you need less water, let's go ahead and pee it out. Um, we talked some uh, maybe with the endocrine system about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system right we see here that the kidney um, is going to be the the organ releasing renin and that plays a huge role in regulating this okay we have some other things as well right so um, it does regulate plasma concentrations of things like sodium potassium chloride a bunch of different ions that'll come back in chapter 27. Um, recall that the kidney helps to synthesize the biologically active form of vitamin D, um, and that's called calcitriol. And so again, you had this whole slew of things happening, right, starting at the skin and that interaction with cholesterol and UV radiation, moving to the liver who modified uh, that molecule slightly, and then the kidney makes the final change um, and makes it vitamin D3 or calcitriol. And this, of course, plays a huge role in calcium absorption, and so therefore blood calcium levels. Um, the kidney also is going to work to stabilize blood pH, a topic in chapter 27, right? The kidney, again, as it's filtering the blood, if, if your blood pH is becoming too acidic, right, if you have too much hydrogen, it says let's pee it out right and we'll hold on to bicarbonate and if the opposite is happening and you're becoming alkaline right your blood ph is too high there's not enough hydrogen the kidney says ah let's hold on to hydrogen right we need that in the body and let's pee out the bicarbonate so your equation is going to come back um, in this chapter um, the kidney also plays a really important role in red blood cell synthesis. So remember EPO from the endocrine system is also released by the kidney and that tells us to make more red blood cells. Um, one thing that your kidney, the your kidney, that your book did not mention, um, is that it also helps, the kidney also helps the liver, um, in detoxifying certain molecules and also in deaminating amino acids. So um, remember, if you wanted to use an amino acid as a fuel source, right, essentially as treat it like a glucose, run it through cellular respiration, we do need to remove um, the nitrogen group and the kidney actually assists the liver um, in doing that. So our humble little kidneys, right, lots of different functions going on, way more than just, hey, getting rid of waste products, right? Um, peeing. Uh, we got a lot of a lot of different functions here. Okay, so let's take a peek here at some anatomy. And again, the majority of this we will um, cover in lab. In fact, that's this week, so that's exciting, right? We move on um, to the urinary system in lab, and so we'll work on doing things like identifying our kidneys and our ureters and our bladder um, and the urethra, right? These are the major portions of this system. Um, and we'll spend more time in here on um, 
some of the smaller anatomy. There is anatomy here um, in this kidney cross section that we will also look at um, in lab, just like we saw in many other organs, right? The outer region of the kidney is called the cortex. The deeper inner region um, is called the medulla. Now, one thing that should jump out to you as you look at this picture um, where they've colored our blood supply for us, the kidneys have an extremely rich blood supply. In fact, um, in order to achieve all of its goals, and it does all of these things, right, filtering blood. So the kidneys actually end up receiving around 20% of the cardiac output, right? 20% of the blood volume that's leaving the heart um, is actually coming to the kidneys. Um, other things to point out in here, so we'll talk about um, some of the microscopic structures in here in the kidney, but basically we will see that urine is being um, formed um, here in the medulla. It's actually going to, I think your book has a better picture, here we go, um, each of these like segments of medulla where we're creating urine is called a renal pyramid, it kind of looks like a little triangle. Um, the urine is actually going to drip out the end of this renal pyramid and into a collection area called a calyx. It starts out in a minor calyx where multiple um, come together is a major calyx. And then all that urine dumps into what's called the renal pelvis, right? This big kind of, of catchment area for urine before dropping down the ureter. Okay, so again, we'll look at a lot of this in lab, but in order to understand some of the physiology, it is important to understand, say, where the cortex is, where the medulla is and that we have an extremely rich blood supply. Okay, so here's an even um, more zoomed in view. And so one of the things that's essential, right, about understanding um, the kidney is that the, the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron. And we will jump in here to the, the microscopic anatomy of the nephron. But realize that basically these are the parts, when I say functional unit, right, these are the parts of the kidney that actually are doing the concentration of urine. And we have two major kinds. We have these cortical, ah, see, this is where you need to know that this is the cortex, these cortical nephrons where you see most of the, the structure actually staying in the cortex, a little bit might dip down um, into the medulla. And then we have what's called a juxtamedullary nephron right? So uh, a big portion of the nephron is up here in the, the cortex, but some of these tubes, particularly this big loop, dives down in um, to the medulla, and this is called a juxtamedullary nephron. These are the nephrons that really do the urine concentrating. So it's kind of interesting to me. I'm, I'm actually really fascinated by comparative um, physiology, right? How do humans um, compare to other organisms? So only about 15% um, of our nephrons are this juxtamedullary kind, the kind that's actually really good at concentrating urine. The other 85% are cortical. Um, and these guys do a great job of filtering blood and um, you know removing waste and things like that, but they don't make a super concentrated urine. And so humans are actually not that good um, at making urine. Um, the most we can concentrate urine is to around 1200 milliosmol. So milliosmol or osmolarity is a measurement of the saltiness. So you'll see that a lot. Your blood is around 300 milliosmol and the most concentrated urine a human can make, right? Like when it's like yellow and dark urine is around 1200 milliosmol. So like a fourfold concentration. There are other animals. Remember last week I was mentioning the um, the kangaroo rat, right, who relies on metabolic water um, from metabolism for his water supply, right? He doesn't have access to, to free water, doesn't have juicy food to eat. Most of his water supply um, is coming from that metabolic water. You better believe that kangaroo rat is almost all juxtamedullary nephrons in his kidney. It's going to do a really good job um, making super concentrated urine. In fact, it's so concentrated, it's practically solid. Um, so anyway, um, humans are not the best <laughs> at everything. Um, and this is definitely an example. Um, we are adequate, right? As long as we have enough water available to us. Okay, um, so juxtamedullary nephrons are the ones that really do the concentration. So here's what our nephron actually looks like. 
right? So again, zooming in, here's our cortical nephron. Actually, we'll go a little bit closer here in our juxtamedullary nephron. One thing I did want to point out from this picture is what's often left out um, in pictures of the nephron because it gets super confusing, right, is we're going to talk about all these tubes here, right? These are part of the nephron and how they go about concentrating urine. But notice this picture actually shows all the capillaries. And this is really important. It just gets messy in our drawings, right? We have to have these, um, what we call paratubular capillaries, capillaries that are next to the tubes in order for us to reabsorb substances into the blood supply. So when you hear reabsorption, right, um, in the kidney, it's going back into these paratubular capillaries. So when we filter the blood at the kidney, we're going to start out with a ton of water, for example, in what we call the filtrate. That's like the starting point for urine. We want to reabsorb most of it. We want to put most of it back into the bloodstream. And so this is the bloodstream that it's going to go into. So we will look at that. I just did want to point out um, that you'll notice a lot of pictures um, from here on out are leaving that out. And you kind of have to, right? It just gets really messy. Um, okay, so here's kind of the, the really zoomed in view um, of a nephron. So just to make sure that we have the anatomy of a nephron, and then we'll jump in uh, to the physiology next. So the first portion of a nephron, um, how do I want to say this? The nephron starts out at a bundle of capillaries called the glomerulus. This is just like a little knot of capillaries. And you see an arrow here. This is where filtration is going to take place as we push things out of this capillary. Okay. Now notice there is an afferent arteriole coming into the glomerulus and an efferent arteriole leaving. Those are important terms, right? And remember, um, just this should this should be easy terminology for you, right? Just like um, neurons. You had afferent neurons going towards the brain, efferent coming away. And so that's exactly what's happened, happening here. The afferent brings blood to the glomerulus and the efferent arterial is going to carry it away. Now, they're not showing the rest of the blood vessels, but this efferent arterial is what is going to lead to all those capillaries that I was just mentioning, right? So here's that sorry, in the way. Here's that efferent arterial becoming the paratubular capillaries, right? So trying to reabsorb stuff that we got rid of. Okay, so that's the glomerulus. Everything that is filtered out of the glomerulus, right, pushed out of the blood supply, is going to go into this kind of catcher's mitt of a, um, of a structure here called the Bowman's capsule. Okay, that's this catcher's mitt here. Um, so the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule together are referred to as the renal corpuscle. Okay, um, again, everything that comes out of the blood is called filtrate and it's going to move into this series of tubes. Our first tube is called the proximal convoluted tubule. Proximal meaning close, convoluted, absolutely. Okay, um, and again, this image is giving you kind of the big picture, right? This is where most of the reabsorption takes place, but that's the physiology. I'm going to wait. Um, from there, the filtrate moves into what is called the nephron loop. Or the loop of Henley. Same, same names. Henley is the guy who discovered this, right? But nephron loop um, is maybe a little more general. Okay. Um, what one thing you will notice, right, is we'll talk about the differences between what happens in the descending limb in the nephron loop and what happens in the ascending limb. They actually behave very differently. So that's going to be important. But remember this loop is what can jut down into the, to the medulla. And this is where um, we really kind of hone our ability to concentrate urine. Um, filtrate then moves on into the distal convoluted tubule. Um, distal, it's further <laughs> from the Bowman's capsule. And again, it's convoluted, right? It's wavy. Um, and that is technically the end of the nephron. From there, you have a bunch of distal convoluted tubules, we'll abbreviate that DCT, um, coming into the collecting duct. And while it's not truly part of the nephron, 
it is extremely important um, in our ability to reabsorb. Um, this is like our last chance to reabsorb things like water. Um, we'll see this playing a huge role in the reabsorption of sodium, um, in acid base balance, etc. So the collecting duct um, is super important. Okay. Um, okay, before we move into physiology, like the nitty gritty of it, one thing that is essential to understand um, in here is when we talk about the nephron, right, we are going to talk about filtration. So actually pushing substances across a membrane, right, keeping the big things behind, letting the small things through. We will talk about reabsorption. And again, I was emphasizing that this is pulling those substances out of the filtrate, those things that are destined to get peed out, we're gonna reabsorb them, right? Hold on to them. We take them back into the blood supply at those paratubular capillaries. And then we'll also talk a lot about secretion. Secretion is going to be when we then are purposefully trying to put things into the filtrate. So we see this primarily um, in the DCT and the, the collecting duct where some things that weren't filtered. So um, a lot of our wastes, um, urea, etc. This would be a time when we could put those um, back in to the the filtrate. Here we go. Ions, acids, drugs, toxins. Actually, add those to the filtrate to make sure they get excreted. So I usually say secrete it to excrete it. Right. So reabsorption. Hold on to secrete it. We're gonna pee it out. Okay. So. That's it, I think, on the anatomy. And so I'll wrap that one up and then we'll jump, jump into another video and talk about um, the physiology. So we'll kind of pick up in 26.3 when we start talking about urine production.